Hello, I'm Paul Innes, Professor of Shakespeare Studies. Welcome to my channel, Shakespeare for All. Today, I'm going to be talking about Othello. This is one of three videos on the play dealing with characterisation, plot and context. And in this episode, we'll be discussing the plot. At the end of the videos, there are some useful study tips together with a list of keywords. Now, I use the MIT online version of these texts because it's accessible together with the Arden 3rd edition. If you're studying for assessments, editions like this with supporting material, introductions, notes, appendices and so on, that's the kind of thing you want. If you want to know more, please remember to subscribe. Now, before we begin, I'd like to wave to Mike and Andy Green. Mike's an old friend of mine since our time in Warsaw, and his brother Andy did an English literature degree quite recently. Mike mentioned the channel to Andy and he says he finds it very informative. So thanks for spreading the word and for the feedback. Now, this video comes in three parts, pretty much. First of all, we're going to take each act in turn. We'll look at the length of the individual scenes, how the play moves between them, what happens inside them, how it happens and the speed at which it happens, the momentum. This means we can look at the implications of the structure of the play for the plot development as a whole. The second thing that we'll do is provide some study tips, key ideas which will help to focus your attention on major plot, plot elements. And the third element will be the keywords. The first of these three will be the longest when we actually look in some detail at how the play moves from act to act, scene to scene. So on the screen, you'll see an overview of this play. It's quite logically structured. Act one has three scenes, act two has three, act three has four, act four has three, act five has two. Also, what you'll see is that the number of lines in the various acts is actually pretty constant amongst the first four before you get to the finale with act five, which is a bit shorter, okay? What this means is that the exposition, the movement of the play, the development of the play is very, very even throughout, okay? It's very evenly balanced. However, many of the individual scenes are extremely intricate and can be further subdivided into sub-scenes, which is the procedure I'm going to adopt. We'll look at these in some detail. So act one, medium length initial scene, then a short one, then a very long one. This entire act is set in the Italian city of Venice. It begins with Rodrigo and Iago in conversation. Rodrigo is a rather foolish, wealthy young man, aristocrat, who's been wanting to marry a Venetian heiress called Desdemona. Iago is an army officer working for Desdemona's new secret husband, Othello. He's promised to help Rodrigo, but is actually fleecing him of all of his cash. He's the Machiavell figure. He's the manipulator. He has no morals whatsoever, completely cynical. He will do whatever it takes to get him to where he wants to go. They enter in mid-conversation and are shouting up at the house of Desdemona's father, Brabantio, to tell him about the fact his daughter isn't there, and she should be. Watch for La Iago's language here. His language is absolutely vile. He's a misogynist and a racist and all the rest of it. He's a horrific character which makes him very interesting to play. Watch for what Brabantio says when he appears and starts going, oh, where's my daughter, where's my daughter? It's all about him, okay? Because his daughter matters to the household which is gendered masculine. Patriarchy is important here, as is inheritance. Desdemona is an heiress. She matters. The other thing to note the play does this quite a few times before we even see her, is that these are all descriptions of a woman before she turns up on the stage. In other words, we are given masculine versions of what she means before we actually see her. What this does is it says to the audience, watch for this. This woman is going to be important. The meanings ascribed to what this woman is and what she does are going to matter. In fact, they're the linchpin for the play. We then have Act 1, Scene 2. Iago's slipped off because he doesn't want Brabantio to see him. And Othello is in conversation with Iago, accompanied by attendants. Othello's making comments about the value of his service to the Venetian state. He's an outsider. 
Iago knows this and is going to work with it. Now they are interrupted by the arrival of Othello's lieutenant, Cassio. Basically, the Turks are at it again, there's a war on, you need to come to the council. There's going to be a council of war. And there's an interrupt as Brabantio arrives with his household. He's fuming because Othello, the Moor, has secretly married his daughter. Civil disturbance is threatening to undo the war effort. They patch up a truce. It looks as if there's going to be a fight, but Othello calms it all down and they all troop off to the council chambers. Again, there is more description. I use a term called reportage, which is not great, but it denotes not just mentioning something that happens off stage or someone off stage, it's something important that's going on off stage, something that draws the audience's attention to what this person or series of events means. That's what you have with Desdemona in this play. There's then a very intricate scene, Act 1, Scene 3, 403 lines. Okay, The average, the average line length of a scene in Shakespeare is probably about 100 to 125. This one's nearly four times that length. It's composed of seven sub-scenes. It's often called a trial scene because in effect, at one point, Desdemona's put on trial, more or less, to justify what she's done. Now, it begins with a council of war. The Duke, the Doge of Venice, Shakespeare calls him a Duke, wrongly, uh, is in a council of war with his advisors. The Turks are on the move, what we're going to do? This is interrupted by the arrival of the households of Othello and Brabantio in the middle of the fight. Brabantio complains about what, ha what has been happening to his daughter. More reportage about Desdemona. She's still not on stage and everybody's talking about her. Othello's questioned by the Duke. He suggests, go and ask her, bring her here. She can answer. As that's happening, he recounts how he gained her love. So you get another layer of what I've called reportage. Somebody else talking about her, this time her husband. Finally, she comes in at line 170. There's a crucial interaction between Desdemona, Brabantio and Othello, presided over by the Duke. It's effectively a trial. Once that's completed, Brabantio says, OK, fine. You've married us. Not a lot I can do about it. I'm not happy about it, but on you go. The council returns to the business of the war. This is the fifth sub-scene here. Desdemona is going to go as well, although separately from her husband. She's to be left in the care of Iago, following on afterwards. At this point, everybody leaves the stage except Iago and Rodrigo. They're the people who started the play, remember. Iago is a kind of officer. He's actually an ensign. He's a, a flag bearer. He's called an ancient. He's the guy who carries the general standard in battle. It's actually extremely important. Rodrigo is the young man who wanted to marry Desdemona and he's distraught. You know, the marriage has been accepted. What are we going to do? And Iago has to persuade him. It's not all lost, man, you know. Besides, I need your money. The crucial prose conversation, right? No poetry. It moves to prose, which denotes some plotting, if you like. It's not formal language. And Iago talks about identity. He manipulates Rodrigo, gets his spirits up and then he leaves. And then he turns to the audience and talks about the guy. He says, this guy's a waste of space. I know it, but I enjoy it. And I'm also going to try to work out how I'm going to destroy Othello because I feel like it. Iago's motivations are murky, to put it mildly, but the interest is not psychological. The interest is watch what he does. And he talks directly to the audience. He does this a lot. You'll see this time and time again. Machiavelli soliloquy by Iago. We now move to Act 2. We've gone from Venice to Cyprus, which is the naval base for their operations against the Turks. This act has two quite long scenes with a short one in the middle. Act 2, scene 1, 310 lines, okay? Although there are few scenes in each act in this play, they're mostly quite long. Not all of them, but most of them. Various important local personages have gathered on the quayside to await the arrival of the reinforcements from Venice. Desdemona, Iago, Rodrigo and Emilia, who is Iago's wife, who works as Desdemona's gentlewoman servant, they all come on stage at the same time. 
and it's an important piece of social interaction before Othello finally arrives himself. So you get this set piece of everyone turning up in Cyprus. And again, everyone leaves the stage except Iago and Rodrigo. You get a repeat of their earlier interaction. Iago's trying to keep him going. He's trying to say, no, don't worry about it. I'm sure we can do something. We can get you married to Desdemona eventually. Uh, by the way, give me some money. Um, you get another Machiavelli soliloquy by Iago when Rodrigo leaves. You can see the narrative patterning. There's a kind of movement punctuating the action of the play with Iago and Rodrigo on stage together. Rodrigo leaves, Iago talks about him. This is another example. There's then a very short proclamation by a guy come on, a kind of town crier, town crier guy, who basically says, by the orders of General Othello, the Turkish fleet has been dispersed by winds. Everybody go away and have fun. The 12 lines long. It's just basically setting things up. Now, what we do is we move on to Act 2, Scene 3, and this is another one of these complex scenes. This place full of them. This is why I'm going through this in detail, so you get a sense of what's happening here. This one is 383 lines, nine sub-scenes, okay? Iago is starting to manipulate everybody, and the actual staging becomes quite intricate to mirror what he's doing. So watch for the movements on and off stage, who's on stage, who's saying what to whom, and what Iago's doing to people. That's what's happening. It begins with a short section where Othello, Cassio, and Desdemona, remember Cassio's Othello's second in command, if you like, they all come on together, and then Othello and Desdemona head off, and Cassio's on stage alone. Iago comes in. He thinks, okay, we're supposed to be having fun. Have a drink. Cassio's like, I don't hold my drink very well. Iago knows this. He more or less forces the guy to have a drink. He knows he can't handle his alcohol. Cassio sort of weaves his way off the stage. Iago, left alone, what's he going to do? Another Machiavelli soliloquy directly to the audience as he outlines his plan. Cassio staggers back on. He's accompanied by Governor Montano of Cyprus and some of the gentry. And there's a party. Cassio's getting quite tipsy by this point. Cassio exits. Maybe he's gone to the loo. You know, he's, he's, he's drunk, he's half cut. He really cannot handle his drink. And Iago does something, watch for this. He does this all the way through the play. When somebody goes off stage, he says to somebody else, watch him, he's not that good. He's dodgy. Mm. He's always getting drunk. It's all lies, but that's the way Iago works. He manipulates, he gatekeeps information, he tells you the wrong thing about someone. At this point, Rodrigo appears and Iago sends him after Cassio. He basically says, he wants to start a fight. And you hear it starting off stage. So you get more of that off stage representation. Cassio, drunk, chases Rodrigo back onto the stage and then starts a fight with the governor of Cyprus. And Iago sends Rodrigo off to raise the alarm. That's when Othello comes in. He tries to find out what's happened. And there's an important reference to his passions. He says, don't make me lose my temper. You wouldn't like me when, you, when I lose my temper. I go completely berserk. That's important foreshadowing. Iago lies to him. Gives him a version of events. And then Othello turns to Cassio and dismisses him from his service. He cashiers the guy. You're no longer in the army, you no longer work for me. At this point, Desdemona comes in. Everybody mills around the place and then they'll leave. This time, Iago is left on stage with Cassio. And there's a shift to prose as they discuss what's happened. It's an important scene here because Cassio goes on about his reputation. Reputation matters. Right? Reputation in this period is central to self-identity. It's bound up with who you are within society. It's a social conception of identity. For men, reputation is based on your position in the world. Cassio's just lost that. It's gendered. For women, it's different, as we'll find out with Desdemona. It's about your chastity. Right? For men, it's about active. For women, it's about where you are within patriarchal conceptions of what you do as a woman. Cassio is distraught, he's lost his job, he's lost his reputation. And Iago says, oh, don't worry about it, I'll sort it all out. Yeah, right, that's going to happen. 
what's going to happen next? The audience is thinking, Cassio's leaving, Yago's on the stage. Yes, here comes another Machiavellian soliloquy, which is what you get. Rodrigo then comes back on and Iago has to manipulate him. He has to smooth things over. He has to get him to do what he wants again. And then Iago gives another short Machiavellian speech, soliloquy to the audience. So he's the one on stage basically directing the audience as well as the on stage action. He's the director of the play. He's the one who's telling you what to think, what's going to happen. And you've got no choice because you have to sit there and listen to him. Shakespeare's audience, most of them were standing. This guy's manipulating you and there's nothing you can do about it. This is an incredible role. This guy's good at what he does. We now move on to Act 3. This is the middle of the play. The third scene in Act 3 is immensely long, massively important, right in the middle of the play, because that's when Iago goes to work on Othello directly. You have two relatively short scenes before you get to that. Act 3, scene 1 is line, this is only 57 lines long. Iago and Cassio again. Cassio says he's hoping that Iago's wife, Emilia, remember she works for Desdemona, can, Emilia might be able to help me see her. Iago says, oh yeah, not a problem. I'll go and fetch her. She comes on and they try to talk. And she tells Cassio that Desdemona is already acting on his behalf with Othello. There's then a really strange little scene. It makes no sense in terms of plot development, but it shows Othello at work. It's only six lines long. While everybody else is partying and getting drunk like Cassio and then regretting it, Othello is investigating the defences of the Citadel. Okay? He's a general first and foremost. That's shown to you because this is the last time that you actually see him in control of his faculties. It's, this guy's at war. He's good. It's not going to last. You then have Act 3, Scene 3, 482 lines long, divided into seven very intricate sub-scenes. Number one, Desdemona, Emilio and Cassio are all on stage together, talking. Iago and Othello come on at a different entrance and Cassio leaves and you get a moment of split staging. You've got Cassio leaving the women and you've got Iago and Othello coming on and Iago says, oh, I don't like that. Mm, that looked a bit dodgy. It's not like him just to steal off like that. I don't mean anything by it. Just observing. You can see the way he's manipulating Othello already. And all it's done is come on the stage. Desdemona sees her husband and presses Cassio's suit. Cassio wants to be reinstated. Othello tells her to leave, which she does, taking Emilia with her. This clears the stage. And as the audience watching this play, you should know by now, when Iago is on stage alone with one other person, he's going to manipulate them. That is what he does every single time. And that's what he does to Othello. He works on him. Starts fanning the flames of his jealousy. Eventually, this is so subtle, Iago leaves. Othello is on stage for the first time ever. And he then speaks a Machiavellian soliloquy badly because he's got it all wrong. He talks to the audience in the same way that Iago talks to the audience. He's almost like a second-rate Iago and he's getting it all wrong. Desdemona comes back on with Amelia and there's a bit of interaction. Watch for this, it's so important. Tiny, tiny stage detail. Desdemona's leaving with Othello. He's going, oh, I've got a headache. I don't want to talk to you, I've got a headache. And she gets a handkerchief out and goes, oh, I'll sort it for you, I'll sort it for you. And she drops it. He sort of goes, no, 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 it's all right. And says, I'll just leave it. This handkerchief is going to be so important. Neither of them even remembers this scene. Neither of them remembers what happens here, but he tells her to leave it alone. And this handkerchief is going to become symbolic of his jealousy, and it's his own fault. So remember that. Emilia finds the hanky. Okay, this is sub-scene five of seven. She goes, oh, wonder what happened here? Iago turns up. Oh, I love that, he says. I can use this. Nasty bit of interaction between the two of them as he grabs the handkerchief from her and she leaves. Iago's alone on the stage. Oh, what's going to happen? Another Machiavelli soliloquy. Look what I'm going to do with this handkerchief. I'm really, really going to go to town on Othello now. 
and then Othello comes back on stage. Iago puts a hanky away so he doesn't see it, and Othello's obviously been thinking too much, and Iago resumes his manipulation of Othello. You can see the way Iago works the stage, right? Every time he's on his own, something happens. Every time he's on his own with another character, something happens. Act three, scene four, 202 lines. This one, again, is complicated. Four sub-scenes. This time, a lot happens quite quickly. You see Amelia and Desdemona. Uh, Desdemona's worried about the handkerchief. She's realised it's missing. Othello comes on and questions her. Emilia watches what's going on and she makes a sort of comment about Othello and jealousy as he leaves again. She's going, I, I'm sure he's jealous. Why? I've no idea. I don't know what's going on, but he's, he's, he's got all the signs of it. Then separately, Iago comes in with Cassio. It's like, oh, let's sort everything out. And Iago leaves and eventually so do all the others. For the first time in the play, Cassio's alone on stage. Now, unlike Iago, he doesn't do anything with it. He's not in command of the stage. He's there on his own, and you get a little scene when Bianca comes on. Now, Bianca, it's uncertain who she is. Iago calls her a courtesan, basically calls her a whore, but that's Iago. You don't trust Iago. He'll say that about anybody, and he's misogynistic anyway. He hates women. He hates everybody. Uh, the point is, Bianca is a quite well-off woman from Venice, who's in love with Cassio and has followed him to Cyprus. And to fob her off, Cassio gives her this hanky that he happens to have found in his quarters because Iago planted it there. So Cassio has now given Othello's handkerchief to this other woman, whom Iago will call all sorts of things. You can see the way that he's doing things. He's even manipulating things off stage by dropping them in at people's doors. We move on to Act 4. There are two complex scenes and then a shorter one. This is Act 4, Scene 1. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. 282 lines, 8 sub-scenes. Starts with an important scene between Iago and Othello. Subsection, if you like, as they enter in mid-conversation. You then get split staging. Very common in this play. Othello is kind of stupefied in a corner. He, he kind of goes into a fugue state. He doesn't know what's going on. He's lost it completely. And Cassio comes on talks to Iago, doesn't notice Othello's there, and then leaves again. And Iago directs, I can't think of another term for it, he takes over, it's like he's directing the play, he directs Othello to overhear a conversation he's going to have with Cassio. So the split staging as this takes place. Othello is in the observer's position, but Iago manages it so that Othello gets it all wrong. And Othello comments to the audience, wrongly about everything he's seeing and the audience should at this point be going he's behind you where do you think pantomime comes from right? it's the same logic of audience participation everything is visually reinforced for Othello when Bianca comes in with the handkerchief she leaves and so does Cassio by this point Othello's seriously losing it Critical conversation. This is the fifth section of this scene. Very important conversation between Iago and Othello. Basically, Othello just says to him, How can I kill my wife? Where's the proof? You know, doesn't matter. That's just what he thinks. And then a really clever moment by Shakespeare. Stage interrupt. Can't think of another way to put it. Lodovico turns up with other envoys and letters from Venice. So you think, oh, what's going to happen here is going to domestic tragedy. There is a domestic tragedy, but then the public world intrudes. Public and private are not so clear cut in this period. Desdemona and various other attendants are with them. And as a crucial moment of social violence, as Othello publicly insults Desdemona and hits her, Right? You cannot overstate how important this is for reputation. We think of jealousy as a personal psychological thing. In this period, to do something like this publicly to your wife is really serious. That's what Othello does with no justification. Desdemona leaves and then so does Othello. 
That leaves Iago and others. What's going to happen? Let's think. Oh, I'll manipulate them. So Iago lies to Lodovico and the others. He says, well, he's always beaten his wife. Of course she doesn't. That's not what happens. But he's lying anyway. He's the gatekeeper of the information. We then move to Act 4, Scene 2. 246 lines. This one, only seven subsections, okay? Othello is questioning Emilia, sends her off to fetch Desdemona. He speaks a nonsense soliloquy. When Othello's on stage speaking a Machiavelli soliloquy, he does it badly because he's wrong. It's not like Iago who's in control. He's lost it completely. It's madness. And then Desdemona enters with Emilia. Othello orders Emilia to leave and there's a crucial scene between him and his wife. He then shouts for Emilia to come back on. This guy is totally out of control. This is not the same man who was in utter control when he married this woman in Venice and controlled the possibility of a civil fight. He's completely lost it. And then he leaves himself. And the two women are like, what's all this about? And they discuss what happened. We're obviously moving towards the catastrophe. Emilia leaves briefly. Desdemona gets some stage time. This is just about the only time she's on the stage on her own. But it's not a proper soliloquy because she genuinely doesn't understand what's going on. And Emilia comes back with her husband, Iago. You get another conversation. This is the sixth subsection in this scene about the importance of reputation. As I said earlier, for women, reputation is gendered feminine. It's about your chastity, your behaviour as an unmarried woman, or in the case of Desdemona, a married woman. Emilia and Desdemona leave, and Rodrigo turns up. What's going to happen? You should know by now. Iago's going to manipulate him again, which is what happens. Iago leaves with him in mid-conversation, persuading him to try to kill Cassio. <laughs> that's, that's the stage we've got to. There's then a relatively short scene at 4, scene 3, 104 lines, where it's Othello, Desdemona and Amelia. And again, he leaves the two women on stage alone, and again they discuss Othello's behaviour. Desdemona sings a famous Willow song, which is kind of foretelling her own death, effectively. And Emilia makes some very worldly wise comments on marriage and gender. It differentiates the two women. It shows that Desdemona is actually still quite naive and innocent. Is this the same person who controlled everything at the beginning of the play? We'll talk about that in the video on characterisation. Act 5 has two scenes. The first is shorter than the second, but a lot happens. It's quite intricate. This is 129 lines. Seven Subscenes in 129 lines. In other words, the action is picking up as you move towards the end. First of all, it's, it's in the streets, effectively. Iago sets up Rodrigo to ambush Cassio and then hides. Cassio comes on and, despite being surprised, defeats Rodrigo in combat. Right? Cassio's actually quite good. You wouldn't want to mess with this guy. He's a soldier. He's an officer. Despite ambushing him, Rodrigo loses. So what does Iago do to even the score? He backstabs Cassio. Slices down his leg from behind and then does a runner. You then get split staging. As Othello comes on, looks at these two guys writhing on the stage, Rodrigo and Cassio, and comments on the murder of Cassio badly to the audience, as if he's a Machiavelli, and then leaves again. So it's becoming quite frantic and quite unpleasant as well. The Venetians turn up, Lodovico and Graziano arrive, and there's more split staging with Rodrigo moaning from the wounds Cassio's given him. So what does Iago do? Iago turns up and finishes Rodrigo off. Now you could do that in all sorts of ways, maybe he just slits the guy's throat. There's, I mean, Iago is good at what he does. Bianca comes in and tends to Cassio, and Rodrigo's identity is discovered. And then Emilia arrives as well. And at this point, Iago makes some really nasty comments about Bianca. She's a strumpet, she's a courtesan, she's a whore. He's, I mean, you cannot trust anything this guy says. That's us moving towards the end of the play. Act 5, scene 2. The end arrives. 369 lines. Only six sub-scenes, so it's not too bad. Begins with Othello coming in to kill Desdemona. Bit of interaction between them, and then he smothers her. 
interrupted by Amelia banging at the door trying to get in. She knows something's wrong. Desdemona finally dies and Othello threatens Amelia. The Venetians come in. Graciano, Iago, Montano, the governor of Cyprus, the whole lot of them, they've heard the noise. Amelia to defies Iago to tell the truth. The Moor is jealous of his wife, saying she's done things with Cassio. Where did that come from? That must have been you. You made that up, didn't you? Eventually, Iago stabs his wife from behind and then leaves. Montana and Graciano follow, leaving Othello alone with the dying Amelia. They think they've disarmed him, but he pulls out another weapon. This guy's got weapons all over the place. They then come in again, Graciano comes in again, is confronted by Othello, and others come in with officers holding Iago's prisoner. They've managed to get hold of him. Cassio's in a chair because of his leg wound. There are various revelations, led by Rodrigo's incriminating diary writings. He's been writing everything down that Iago's been telling him. Iago didn't even know that. Even this late on, Iago refuses to say why he did what he did. Right? You never find out really what he was up to, why he did it. And Othello kills himself and there's the usual final Renaissance tragic comment about the fact this is a tragedy. And in this case it's spoken by, as usual, a my, relatively minor character, which is Lodovico. So you can see the way the play moves. The plotting is extremely sophisticated. So, time for some study tips. How do you deal with this if you're going to write about it? Now, obviously, there's going to be a lot more detail on each of them in the video and characterization, but what I'm proposing to do is look at how the three main figures, Othello, Iago and Desdemona, function in relation to the plot. I don't always concentrate on characters in this way when I talk about the plot, but in this case, it's kind of necessary. So study tip one of three, Othello as protagonist or central main figure. His role has three main stages, if you like, developmental stages, or rather circular stages. Part one, when he's in control of a situation, when he's in Venice, think of it like that. Part two, when he loses it completely in Cyprus, manipulated by Iago, and then part three, he moves around to be back in control at the end of the play when it's too late and he's murdered Desdemona and he's realised that he's been practised upon by Iago for whatever reason. Now the problem for Othello, this is how to think of Othello in relation to the plot, he's an outsider. He's what we call a liminal figure. He's not Italian, He's not Turkish, he's from somewhere in between. He has elements of both. He's from a culture that seems quite hazily considered in the play, somewhere in between. His skin colour marks him as an outsider, and although he's a great war leader, needed by the state, he knows he's not up to much in other areas. He knows that he's not good with the intricacies of Italian intrigue. Iago knows that as well, and Iago uses that against him. Right? So Othello is not quite Venetian, not quite Turkish. He's a Moor. He's from a different culture, and he's caught in the middle. He's caught in between two worlds. Study tip two or three. What do you do with Iago as antagonist? Iago gives three different reasons at different points in the play for hating Othello and wanting to destroy him. None of them's convincing. He actually says that himself at one point. It's an excuse. It'll do. The point is, he's not psychologically coherent. You could argue Othello isn't, you could also argue Desdemona isn't. He's just a bad guy, he's a stock Renaissance character type, he's probably the most famous Machiavell figure, manipulator, cynic, would do anything to get what he wants. But Othello seems actually quite passive in relation to Iago, we might as well call the play Iago. You know, he's on stage more often than Othello, he controls the stage and he has more lines. His language is vile. Watch some of the lines he speaks. He's misogynistic, he's racist, he's absolutely horrific. He's completely out for himself. Obviously for him as a man from relatively low rank, he has to work for a living. That's why his wife is in service to Desdemona. The only way up, as far as he's concerned, is to manipulate other people to get what he wants. He's the Machiavelli. His motivations don't matter. He's just a bad guy. That's it. Study tip three of three, Desdemona. What do you do with Desdemona? Now, 
The first point to note is that she is absent for a large part of the initial exposition of the play. She is talked about by everybody. She's defined by all of the men in the play in different ways, depending on their own position. This means that her, the first stage of her characterisation, if you like, is actually done without her being on stage. Other people are talking about her, defining, discussing who she is, what she might mean. That's a sign to the audience, this is going to matter. Because, of course, the play turns on Desdemona and what's said about her. She finally arrives on stage in the Council of War scene, Act 1, Scene 3, often called the trial scene because, in effect, that's what happens to her. She's even allowed to speak for herself, explaining why she fell for Othello, marrying her without her father's consent, all the rest of it. Now, that's a potential contradiction especially for modern actors, because once she arrives in Cyprus, once she's married, she suddenly seems incredibly passive. She lets the guy smother her for no reason. Right? Othello's completely wrong, but he's my husband. Okay, die. That doesn't work. Not in modern psychological terms, but these characters can be contradictory on that stage. She doesn't understand why Othello's angry with her, but she doesn't do or even say anything about it. So to finish, this is the third part of this video, we'll look at some key words, and there are quite a few of them here. You'll see them on the screen. First one is exposition, the process that reveals elements of the plot and the way they relate to one another. If you can get some of these terms into an essay, it should score more marks because it means you're in control of the vocabulary. It looks good. Patriarchy, social system constructed in such a way that women are accorded almost no rights, even if they are in theory, like an heiress or a widow perhaps, in practice they are at best second-class citizens when compared with the men. Inheritance matters. Being an heiress really matters. In a patriarchal society, inheritance is supposed to be through the male. But there's a problem. What do you do when it's a woman? What do you do when the only child of a major household is a woman like Desdemona or Juliet, for example? Marriage is supposed to transfer the assets of the household to the husband, controlled by the men. What Desdemona does is marry for love. She chooses who she marries and she doesn't tell her father. That disrupts the logic of patriarchy. I've mentioned this term reportage because I can't think of a better one. It's a method of offstage representation. In other words, representation of offstage events that are crucially important. This isn't just about so-and-so said this. Oh, okay, then fine. This is about something that matters, something that's central, pivotal to the plot. It emphasises the importance of the meanings being generated by this event, or in this play, this person. The main example, obviously, is other people defining or discussing Desdemona. I mentioned the Machiavell. This is a stock character type in Renaissance drama. It denotes an arch manipulator, usually someone usually a man, not always though, of relatively low social rank who needs to use his wits to rise in the world. It's derived from the name Machiavelli, Renaissance Italian political theorist, author of The Prince, associated with deeply cynical, amoral dealings with other people. That's the English Machiavelli. I've also used the term interrupt because I can't think of another way to do this. It denotes an important plot moment that interrupts what's going on stage. The action is disturbed by the arrival of someone else or maybe the offstage noise of an event, some kind of action that comes in and changes everything. Another thing we've noted in this play, there's quite a lot of prose, not poetry, often signifying conversation between normal people in this play, it denotes a private conversation, often used when characters are plotting something or planning something. Iago and Rodrigo speak in prose in private a lot of the time. Another thing that Iago does is use soliloquy. Speech delivered directly to the audience by a character on their own on the stage. Iago is famous for his soliloquies. He's manipulating us as much as manipulating people on the stage. That's what it does. Crucial social term I've mentioned several times, this is worth remembering, this is worth repeating, is reputation. 
reputation is gendered in this period. For men, your reputation is determined by your worth in the world. Cassio, okay? For women, it's based upon your chastity, either as an unmarried or a married woman. In other words, it's an assumption that your body accords with the dictates and definitions laid down by a patriarchal system. That then leads to gender. In this period, the all-encompassing system of patriarchy needs men and women and defines men and women in accordance with certain categories of behaviour. They're distinctive, they're different, and men are then assumed to be superior. Men are supposed to be powerful and active. Women are supposed to be weak and passive. These are the fundamental components of definitions of masculinity and femininity in the period. Now, of course, we know it's not true, but that's the ideology. That's the system. By acting in and of herself, separately, without her father's consent or even knowledge, Desdemona secretly marries Othello and that disrupts the gendered social codes defined by the patriarchy. So you could argue she needs to be punished. That's the logic of patriarchal revenge on a woman who does what she wants. Some more key words, believe it or not. Uh, emblematic stage practice. This is a moment where something acquires significance way beyond what it means in and of itself. You cannot talk about Othello's jealousy and this play without mentioning his hanky, okay? His bit of rag that he wipes his nose with. Um, the focus on the handkerchief is an excellent example of Renaissance emblematic technique. It doesn't mean anything but it's invested with significance. It's almost as if Othello needs something as a focus for what he's going to do to Desdemona and the hanky will do, right? But it signifies a whole range of symbolic meanings way in excess of just being a bit of rag. A few moments of, uh, just a few keywords of acting technique. The aside, this is a, a moment where one of the actors steps out of the action and addresses the audience directly while other characters are on stage. It's different from soliloquy. The convention is usually this isn't overheard by them. Uh, Iago does this a lot in Othello. Okay, watch for Iago's aside. He sort of leans over his shoulder and says something to someone in the audience. There's no fourth wall. It doesn't work like that. Split staging I've mentioned several times. This is another performance technique. Another word, another phrase for it is simultaneous staging. Those times when the stage is divided into different zones where different things are happening simultaneously. Often for the purposes of one or more characters spying on others or hiding from them. Liminal figure, that's Othello. In this play, he's caught between two worlds. The military experience given him by his cultural origin is different from, even opposed to, his inability to understand the subtle nuances of Venetian society. And that's what Iago uses to destroy him. And finally, it's a self-aware play. Renaissance tragedies usually are. They display an awareness of the fact that the plays, their own artificiality, they're self-referential. You'll see other terms used by critics like meta-theatre, meta-drama. They're posh terms for what's actually quite a common technique. Lodovico does this at the end of this play. He's, he basically says, what a tragedy. And then the play ends. So I hope that helps. The keyword section's quite complex, but I think it needs to be with this play. Good luck with your studies if this is a play that you're using for assessment. If you want to know more, there are videos on characterisation and context for Othello as well as this one, so please remember to subscribe.